Today is October the 22nd, 2021. My name is Tanya Pincham and I'm with Oklahoma Oral History Research Program here at the Oklahoma State University Library. With me is Josh Krushmer, yep. who is the print plan and editor at the New York Times and author of the 2020 book entitled Red Dirt, Roots Music, Born in Oklahoma, Raised in Texas, At Home Anywhere. Did I get that right? You got that right. <laughs> it seems like a good thing to... Uh... To, to have done if you're going to do a history project in a library. <laughs> yes. We are in the library at the, on the OSU campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This interview will be part of the collection entitled We Will Remember Promise. And by way of context, January 27, 2001, a plane crash carrying 10 men associated with the Oklahoma State University men's basketball program. And that day, the university and cowboy community made a promise to always remember these 10 great individuals. And at that time, Josh was the sports editor and lead basketball writer for the Daily Oak Collegian, what we call us, the Oak Collie. So thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Before we talk about the accident and the promise, uh, let's learn a little bit about you. Start wherever you like. Well, you hit the highlights. Um, I am a native Oklahoman, grew up in Altmoggy, about 30 miles south of Tulsa. And really, 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 you know, got to Oklahoma State um, midway through my sophomore year after transferring. So that's about 1999 and immediately um, fell in with the Ocali. Um, just right off the bat, they had me uh, they had me covering uh, tennis my very first semester and then my very first paid um, job for the Ocali was covering the uh, Oklahoma State women's soccer team, uh, the fall semester of my junior year, and never looked back. Um, after junior year, I took a uh, an internship at the Daily Oklahoma in Oklahoma City, and it was not a writing internship, which is what I wanted to do. It was a design and copy editing internship, and I thought, well, it still sounds better than living at home this summer, so <laughs> we'll do that instead. And um, uh, I got there and it turned out I was pretty qualified to be a copy editor and a designer. And that really led to a job waiting for me when I graduated Oklahoma State a year later. And I decided to just give that a go as a career. And 20 years later, here we are. Um, I did what journalists do. Um, if you don't want to lose your job in this climate, I went from Oklahoma City uh, after five years there on the sports desk. I, I moved to uh, Phoenix to work at the Arizona Republic, along with three other Oklahoma State grads um, that all were at the Ocali together. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, uh, after that, it was the Omaha World Herald, the Chicago Tribune, the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Now we're about halfway done with my career. Went from there to the Buffalo News uh, and then the Cleveland Plain Dealer, where I was the uh, assistant managing editor um, overseeing visuals. It was also uh, was also there when uh, LeBron James returned to the Cavaliers basketball team and they won the NBA championship. Cool. Got to be in charge of that coverage. And that led in 2017 to uh, the a, a job at the New York Times, which was a no brainer to take. And. You know, as far as as far as newspapers and journalism go, that was my my goal all along to get someplace that I can um, you know, make my career last as long as I could, and that's what I did. And uh, while all that was going on, to go all the way back to Stillwater, I also fell in with uh, the area's red dirt music scene. Um, wrote about it when I was in college. Write about it now, and that's what that book is about, and uh, it was all centered here in Stillwater, too. Um, Oklahoma State played a big part in that. Uh, the plane crash played a big part in that, and so everything for me has always sort of, uh, you know, never gotten to, uh, too many degrees of separation away from away from here. I have a couple of, uh, couple of uh, younger cousins that were pretty standout wrestlers here at Oklahoma State in the, uh, I'd say about seven or eight years ago now, and um, also had a younger sister graduate from here. So, you know, this, the, the, when people ask me what home is, I usually tell them Stillwater in Oklahoma State, even though I'm actually from Almoghi. 
Um, but I'm just really, really, um, really, really proud of what OSU did for me. And, um, you know, always hope that I represent the university in the way that it should be represented as I go about my day to day life. Well, let's back up a little bit. All right. To, to high school days. Okay. What, did, what, were you involved in activities then? And what, what were you thinking your career might be? I came from a, a very athletic family. Um, my dad and both of his brothers played college football. And so consequently, I was always involved in sports, played football till I couldn't, till, till I was working out in the summer before my senior year of high school and uh, running around our, our track in Almaggi and stepped off the track into a hole and tore my knee up. And that was the end of my football career. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed it nonetheless. Um, also in high school, played tennis. Uh, my junior year, we got second place in state. And um, me and my, I played uh, doubles in, in that tournament and me and my, um, my, my, my partner, we we lost the deciding match that cost us the state championship. And, um, you know, that's Bill's character, too. Um, but I was heavily involved in sports and um, didn't know at the time I was going to be a journalist, but I was on the uh, was the editor of the high school newspaper. Just okay. got to be fun. You know, when you're in high school, you just, you know, you write in the same angsty, smart aleck way that, that teens <laughs> write. And so I never really thought it would lead to a career or anything, but looking back on it, um, you know, sort of one of those Juan chooses the wizard moments. I think I was probably always destined to be a journalist and didn't know it, but throughout high school and um, really throughout college too, my plan was to go to law school. I have a lawyer in the family. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer and I thought that seemed like a good idea. It seems pretty secure. And I did pursue it after I graduated Oklahoma State. I went to law school at Oklahoma City University for a semester and a half. And by that time, a full-time, pretty, especially for this area, pretty well-paying job at the Oklahoman um, was offered to me. And I just thought, you know, this is law school. Uh, this law degree now is clearly it would be a, uh, an exercise in vanity. I'm meant to be a journalist. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Well, were your were your parents into newspapers or, or writing well, or anything like um, that? You know, they they were always real supportive of it. But what, what my parents did to me um, that got me into newspapers was simply subscribing. Um, so the, I, I would say that the real functional, usable internet probably came around when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, before then, you had the America Online and the CompuServes and Prodigies, but um, it wasn't, it was just sort of, the, it felt like a gimmick. But I, you know, high school, high school had internet, sometimes even high speed. Um, but my youth growing up, um, we were, like I said, we, we were a sports family and um the way you experienced sports then was on in the Sunday newspapers, the Tulsa World, the Daily Oklahoman. My mom's dad lived in Oklahoma City, and our Sunday routine was to drive there. We'd have lunch and dinner with them and drive back home, and they would always have the Sunday Oklahoman there, and I'd read the sports section cover to cover. I'd read about Oklahoma football. Um, I'd read about Oklahoma State football, and the columnists uh, who I later got to work with were Barry Trammell and John uh, Rohde and I and Bob Herson too and I never um, at the time you know bylines are almost like movie stars so I never dreamed I'd actually you know get to work for that place or get to work with those people and lo and behold I did and that um, those were the seeds of it and I also had uh, my high school I believe, I believe he taught me uh, algebra and calculus. Uh, Coach Walters, wherever you're at, if you ever hear this, um, he would always have the Tulsa world on his desk. And so my routine at the start of that class was I'd pick up that sports section too, all through high school. And um, that was just the way it was. And one of those, one of those deals for me that I, 
you sort of realize you're living out a lifelong dream, but only after you've already done it. Mm -hmm. um, I just never dawned on me that that's what I was going to do. Yeah. Uh, but it, it sure did work out. So at the, who, who got to the paper first on Sundays at your house? Um, it was always me it's and it was you. always, and I didn't, I didn't care about the, the news section or the business section. It was, um, the sports section in the comics. In the comics. Yeah. <laughs> when I, I pretty much read every Garfield strip and you know, all the little family circus that they, that they could put out. So you've seen the change in newspapers then from. Oh yeah. It's not recognizable to, now, to but, to... um, I do feel like the newspapers now that have, uh, have managed to continue to thrive in the, the current media climate are the ones that, that saw that the world was changing and they no longer tried to be a daily rundown of the day's news. They tried to be a, a daily news magazine and add some depth and context to the day's news, which is what we do with the New York Times now. Um, and you know, being able to watch and be a part of that and contribute to that um, really, really has, you know, for me in some ways, just sort of crystallized the way I've experienced the world for my entire life. So you would have graduated from high school in 1997? So you got it. 97. And then you went where from? from where? Um, so I, I did mention that um, we were a sports family. My dad's oldest brother um, um, lettered in football at OU. So we grew up an OU family. Um, you know, the, I mentioned I had a, a cousin who wrestled for, for Oklahoma State. That would have been Kyle Crutchmer. It was his grandfather. Uh, played at OU and always had OU season tickets. And we were for lack of a better phrase, sooner born, you know, whatever, whatever that, that means. So I graduated high school and made a beeline to the university of Oklahoma. Um, and it was good to me. Um, you know, that's where I took my very first journalism classes and wrote my very first story ever. But, um, you know, I just realized I didn't really fit in there. Um, and after, after about a, a year and a third, so, you know, right about this time of what would have been my sophomore year at OU, I just one day just, just woke up and said, I'm not going to go to class today. And I, I drove up here, walked around campus, had some friends here that I, I chatted with, and walked right into the registrar's office and enrolled. And uh, that was a fun Thanksgiving to, to walk into... <laughs> An OU uh, holiday gathering with all these Sooners dressed like this. Um, that that same uncle, um, the late Larry Crutchmer, um, looked uh, looked at me and goes, well, "What are you going to do at holidays now?" And I'll never forget that. And um, I still have the shirt that I wore. It still fits too. I still have that shirt. Um, it's it's all tattered and, and it's got holes, so I don't really wear it out. But uh, I have it, and it's nice to know when I could if I wanted to. And how did you respond to him? <laughs> um, I believe I said something to the effect of, um, like, there's plenty of cowboys out there. I'll find someplace. <laughs> um, but, you know, I got the last laugh when, uh, you know, his, his grandchildren not only came to Oklahoma State, one of them became an All-American wrestler. And um, the, the, the entire Crutchmer family now is... is it, decidedly orange um nobody even blinks when they say it and i just you know i was the pioneer of that pretty proud of it <laughs> so where did you live when you moved when you moved to campus um so i had some friends from homongi that were here that i'm still really close to um they were in uh, one of the fraternities here i was not in a fraternity at oklahoma which might have been part of the problem but they were and um you know they said just Come join our, come join us here. And um, so for sophomore year and junior year, I lived in the fraternity house at Fourth and Monroe. And um, senior year, lived in an apartment uh, also at Fourth and Monroe. What was the fraternity? Uh, it was off of Tau Omega. Okay. Um, you know, they, they had uh, they had better years than this one, uh, of course, but, uh, you know, in the, by and large, over 
over the time since I've graduated. It's been great to watch them really grow and thrive um, as a group too. When I was there, we really were just building something. Um, and I went from not having anything to do with fraternity life to um, actually being on the Oklahoma State Interfraternity Council. Uh, I was the external vice president and um, got to exercise some early journalism and PR skills when um, all of the uh, fraternities um, got together and agreed on a, uh, on a dry rush, meaning no alcohol when you're recruiting. Um, and when they signed that, um, I was in charge of spreading the word. So I sent these press releases out and we had like we had news, uh, TV news from both cities were here. All the newspaper reporters were, were here. And so um, my very first press release was a success. And um, for a long time, I was really proud of that. It was, it, I remember what year it was. We'll, we'll say it was 2000 because I'll be, I'll be within a year either way. Um, but it, at that time, um, everybody getting together and, and agreeing that even if we're off campus, even if we're at home, we're not going to give alcohol to these 18 year old recruits. It, it, on one hand, you shouldn't do that because it's illegal. But on, on the other hand, it always happened. And just getting everybody together to, to say and sign this statement saying that this isn't us and uh, this isn't what we should be doing. Um, I, I liked it. I thought it was the right message. And so get, being able to help spread that word um, to me was a really, 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 uh, you know, big badge of honor and feather in my cap when I was at OSU. Wow. Yeah. So you knew <clears throat> when, when you came here, you enrolled in journalism. Immediately, yes. Immediately. Do you have a favorite professor or two? Um, my favorite professors, um, uh, so Joey Sinnott, who's still here, Professor Sinnott teaching media law out there somewhere. Um, he was he was really hard on us, um, but uh, in retrospect, he was tough but fair. Um, I liked all my professors, but he was the one that I really retained the most um, the most information from. Um, Stan Kettering was great. Uh, Mike Sowell, I loved him too. Um, but you know, my my favorite staff member at Oklahoma State was. Um, my advisor at the Ocali, it was Jack Lancaster, um, who uh, has since left this mortal world. Um, but he, he understood that we were kids. Uh, he, he, was, he was a super good advisor and he was a super good journalist and editor and made us better at that. He also understood that we were kids um, and really played into it. He knew how to push our buttons. He knew how to, how to he knew how to get us excited for something, and uh, if we did something wrong, he knew how to to make us understand it without making us, you know, feel bad. Um, and he was um, he was an early proponent of me being involved in the Red Dirt music scene too. Uh -huh. Used to give me his old, uh, used to give me his, his CDs and um, the Americana music CDs that sort of were also inspiring the Red Dirt artists, and I still have them. Yeah. So how did how did you end up? Get in the job for the Ocali. Um, I, I kind of asked around. Um, and <laughs> the The consensus that, that I that I was told was just walk into the newsroom and say you'd like to work for us. And so I did. And I just you know, when you're a college sophomore, you don't you don't have a giant resume or anything. So I just walked in with my little. I, I'm a journalism major. And I don't think I had any clips. Left him my email address, and a couple of days later, the sports editor emailed me back, and he said, would you mind going and covering uh, tennis, this tennis match? And so I did, and I wrote about it. And when it ran in the paper, the sports editors followed it with another email that said, would you like to cover all the tennis matches this season? <laughs> and that was the very first beat I ever had. I wasn't paid, but everybody liked it. And so they offered me a job the following semester as a, as a staff writer, meaning paid. Not, I didn't pay much, but they paid. Um, and they told me I'd be covering uh, women's soccer. And so my first paid beat as a journalist was covering um, the 1999 soccer season, back when um, uh, Coach Hancock was the head coach and Coach Carmichael was the assistant. And you know they weren't, they weren't great, but I, I do remember them going down to Norman on a drizzly, rainy, cold uh, for that time of year night and um, beating OU in pretty dramatic fashion and um, 
getting to getting to interview the players and coach Hancock and they didn't care that they were that they were cold and still getting rained on they 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 they'd still be talking right now if I let them I eventually had to say okay I just have to stop because I have to go write this story because I have a deadline that um, everybody was just so happy and it was um well one of the really early um journalistic experiences that I wouldn't trade for anything so you did get to travel or not with them but <clears throat> In your own, get yourself, you know, to get yourself there. Um, yeah, I would, you know, almost always just five bucks of gas and car, I guess the truck at the time, um, and just drive to wherever they were playing if I could get there. Um, and usually that was if it was in the state, but, uh, you know, later on, later on, I, I drove, uh, all over Big 12 country, Ames, Iowa, Columbia, Missouri, um, Austin, um, just to cover whatever football or basketball game there was at the time. Um, on your own dime? More often than not on my own dime, although by the, t- by the time I was covering the those two, the bigger sports, the revenue sports, um, the Ocali would cover um, enough travel to make you feel like, you know, you were getting some help. And that you weren't just, you know, funding your coverage out of your own pocket. And that was a, A, it was important because we were college students with no money, but um, it also was how professional journalists operate to this day. And it was, uh, it was good to be a part of that. Did you have a, I don't know, byline or what was your column called? Did, or did it have a, did it have a name? I had so. I don't know if I've got it written down, though. So, okay. But so, on the sports page, we didn't give our columns names. But if you wrote for the opinion section, which I didn't really do a whole lot, those columns had names. Um, it had ain't, ain't in it, didn't it? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was so absurd. Yeah, okay. So... Um, for my senior year, I chose the name for my opinion page columns, Ain't Got No Sense At All, which is a uh, cross-Canadian ragweed lyric from the song Look At Me. Um, and I thought that was great because uh, I was usually writing about music when I was on that page. However, it sure looked ridiculous when uh, I had to write people's obituaries after the plane crash and that was there. I was like, if I had that to do over again, I would have just said, let's take that off for this. Um, but... That was the way it operated, and uh, I understood that. Okay. Well, then let's just move on into January 27th. All right. Take us take us through that day for you. So, um, my, my involvement with the basketball program started um, the year before, so with the, uh, the, the 2000 season. The senior year for Desmond Mason and Doug Gottlieb and a bunch of uh, um, really, really, really stellar standout basketball players and people that still represent OSU uh, to this day in a, in just a delightful manner. They made it to the Elite Eight. They were a very good team. Um, and th- that was also the last season before they expanded Gallagher Iba. So we had this little compact little, you know, barn on the prairie that was just loud and raucous, sold out for every game. Um, and I wasn't the primary beat writer, but I would still go to lots of games and write little sidebars and um, occasionally columns. Um, near the end of that season, I uh, went to a, a party off campus and... Um, some basketball players got into some things they shouldn't have gotten into. And, um, I had to write about it. Um, professor Stennett made me write about it. He, he would not let me not write about it. So I did. And that caused, um, that caused the basketball, me to be a little bit of persona non grata that postseason. Um, basketball team really wasn't thrilled to, to see me at the big 12 tournament and in the postseason. Um, and when you're, 21 years old and you love sports and these players are still sort of iconic to you. That was jarring. Um, so going into uh, the basketball season the next year, um, the sports information director, Will Hancock, pulls me aside and he just goes, man, look, 
we ended last season badly, but I, I can't have you sitting in the shadows. You know, you, you know, you need to feel free to cover this team as as earnestly as you can. And um, you know, if if I could have done some things differently last year, I would have. But I don't want you to feel like anybody in, in this program, lo- you know, looks down on you you for writing th- that uh, that story. Um, and um, really, was just saying, you know stop being shy and start doing your job. And I really appreciated that, but in a super nice and polite way. Um, and, you know, hearing that gave me just, you know, tons of confidence and resolve. So, um, and I had also covered the, um, the football team that year prior to that and uh, would write columns on Monday and Friday and stories all week. And uh, I, I do remember home, uh, I had written a column before, uh, for homecoming my, my senior year, that was uh, enough to get a personal call from uh, Eddie Sutton. And it was just, he just said, hey man, I really enjoyed reading that. Um, you wrote about something that I try and talk to our players about. Um, and so kind of those two little instances for me sort of gave me the reset that I needed as a student journalist. And so I was very, very, very excited and thrilled um, to be getting to do that. Um, and I built up a pretty decent little rapport with the players and, and with, uh, the athletic department, not just Will, but, um, Mike Notmere, Notware, who was the women's SID and Steve Buzzard, who kind of oversaw the whole operation and, uh, some other folks that are, that are still around, um, Ryan Cameron, just really, really, really good folks in the athletic department. And, um, that was, that was where I learned to, to, forge journalistic relationships and build rapports and, um, and cultivate sources. And it was, it was a really, you know, kind of a little bit of a magical time for me. Um, during that football season, uh, at the time, I don't remember what the actual group was, but it was, um, some sort of organ of, of athletic department, external relations organization that was led by, uh, Carrie O'Keefe. Um, made it a point to uh, take the Ocali uh, writers and photographers on a, on a trip with the uh, the football program. Uh, they would do it every year, and um, my senior year, they 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 offered to take take me to the uh, Oklahoma Texas game in Austin, and I accepted. But then, kind of at the uh, at the eleventh hour, realized there were also some some bands that I wanted to see red dirt bands playing in Austin for that same weekend. And so I, I sent my assistant sports editor in my place. Um, that guy's named Justin Wilmoth and I believe he's a politician in Arizona now. <laughs> um, so I was really, really bummed about that because because, because he came back from that trip is, you know, he, they, they had seated him on, on the, on the charter flight next to Bill Tegan's and that was sort of his idol. And I was really happy that he got to do that. Um, but also just, just incredibly jealous. Um, so I went back to, to Carrie O'Keefe and I said, look, this is my last year here. I'd like to do this with the basketball team. Do you think that's ever possible? And she said, I don't care. I'm just talk to, you got to get Eddie Sutton to sign off on that and uh, buzzard. Um, so I actually had um, been after Will Hancock to, to let me join the team. And the one that I pushed the hardest to, to travel with was that, um, that Colorado game. Um, and then ultimately didn't for the same reasons that I didn't, um, join them at the, on that football trip because there were, um, there were red dirt bands around that I wanted to go see instead. And, um, that was, we'll, we'll get into the chronological part in a second, but, um, you know, I talked about that in the, right after the plane crash and then didn't talk about it, uh, for 20 years till I put my book out because I sort of felt like, um, it, it never really got enough legs and um, looking back on it, Eddie Sutton very well probably would have just said no anyway, or uh, could have. And so I I never wanted to put myself above the uh, people that were actually impacted. Um, but a consequence to that was, um, I think I may have gone a little too far and really didn't talk or, or write, or I pretty much recused myself from all coverage of the plane crash at all um, in the for the succeeding 20 years until this past anniversary um, when I wrote a big piece in the New York Times saying maybe I shouldn't have done that um, because I was there um, and 
as this project says, you know, never forget is a really important thing. And I, I think, um, I think what started out for me as, um, I don't want to make anything about me and this horrible tragedy ended up becoming, um, almost, almost kind of a mental thing. Like I just, one of those things that I, I inadvertently ended up bottling it up for 20 years. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would see coverage and stories about it. And in my head, I would go, like, this isn't right. This needs to be written this way or that way, or, or they didn't talk to this person they should have. But that was my own fault for, um, you know, for lack of a better word, having recused myself from it. Um, so this past spring, uh, this past year, uh, I wrote a big piece in the New York Times on the anniversary that said, uh, said I wouldn't be doing that anymore. Um, that's the roots of that. Um, and that's all, that's the extent of, um, making any uh, of this about me, but I feel like I needed to say that, um, the, uh, the event itself, um, you, first of all, you have to remember that that basketball team that season wasn't by Oklahoma state standards at the time, not very good. Um, they were, they were good enough and they would go on to pull, to win some pretty important games that season. But, um, certainly in the, uh, November, December, January, they, they struggled. They missed the, they missed the veteran leadership of Mason and Gottlieb and they, um, they had a, t a ton of talent, but they just weren't putting it all together. And some other programs in the big 12, had kind of, uh, really asserted themselves. So for most of the early part of that season, I really thought that I was covering a program that, or a team that wasn't going to make the NCAA tournament for the first time in a long time. And they'd struggled a little bit in January and I still have, I still have at home the column I wrote ahead of that Colorado game that said, this is, this could be the most important game of the season. They have to put it together now. Um, and everything, everything leading into that weekend on campus for me, um, the city was pretty normal. It was, I think it was Super Bowl weekend. I think that was, I think that was the same weekend that uh, the Baltimore Ravens beat the New York Giants in the Super Bowl which would have been on a Sunday. So sports wise, we, we had this basketball game was, at the Ocali. We had this basketball game that, um, was important for the program, but that, um, I think we were all a little worried they would go up there and lose. Um, we were all getting geared up for the Super Bowl, and, um, my friends, the same band that, 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 that had the uh, lyric in that column name, uh, Cross Canadian Ragweed were playing a releasing a CD that they had put out and they had a concert in uh, Tulsa on Friday night and here in Stillwater at the Wormy Dog Saloon down on Washington Street on Saturday night. Um, and their lead singers and now one of my oldest friends in the world, Cody Canada had, um, had called me to make sure that I would be at those, um, at those two concerts. And I was like, yeah, I wouldn't even dare. I wouldn't dare miss it. Um, I also had, uh, I think I had ended up with uh, a little bowler hat of his over New Year's Eve that I didn't mean to have in my possession, but he really wanted that back. And so it was one of those, come to these shows, you can skip the line, you can be on our guest list. And telling telling 21 year old me that I would get to be with the band was, uh, uh, you know, at the time, there's, there's no feeling in the world like that. Um, so, that, that is to say that um, you know, the the basketball team could have had, had better seasons, but um, and it didn't feel like there was any sort of you know impending um, steep drop off in where they'd been performing, and and around Stillwater was as normal as you could get. Everything about it was just the way Oklahoma State's campus should be, the way Stillwater should be. Those two concerts were both sold out. Um, I drove over to Tulsa on Friday night, came back here, 
uh, the basketball game was in the afternoon on Saturday, and they did indeed lose. Um, and you know when when we don't have anybody covering a game, the the I mean, we don't have a paper on Sundays anyway. There wasn't much that I I didn't give it much thought. I thought you know well we'll put a recap in Monday's paper and I'll write a column and then we'll move on. Um, but that Saturday there was no job to be done. Um, for me, it was just, okay, it's time to go to this concert and tomorrow's the Super Bowl. Um, and I said, I live in that apartment, uh, fourth and Monroe. And, um, so that is, that was two blocks from Washington street where the wormy dog was. It was a straight walk down and my apartment walked into the wormy dog, uh, when they were kind of just getting set up, um, late afternoon and, they didn't have the basketball game on, but they had, they had TVs on. Um, and everything, everything was pretty normal then too. And they got all set up. They, they, they checked their sound and, and, and the band set up. And then they all, everybody in the band, not me, they all went to a friend's house nearby to change clothes and get ready for their concert. And I stuck around, um, just at that bar and, um, I couldn't tell you at all now what the news report said, but I know they broke into programming on the TV that was in the Army Dog, and uh, the effect was, um, you know, one of the planes did not return uh, or is unaccounted for, something like that. And immediately to me, that was just jarring. Um, that that's not normal at all. So. I walked out of the bar and straight over to the Ocali. I didn't really know what to do, but I knew that I couldn't be in a bar for that. I knew I needed to at least figure out what was going on. So, um, I walked by myself from Washington street, from the strip into the back door of the Paul Miller building, turned on the lights and the TV and just watched. And, um, that's how I experienced it. And this really dark and quiet, um, almost eerie um, newsroom and um, just watching watching the reports come in on TV and suddenly it's you know when, when you first see a report like that there's always this this um, what's the what's the word confused confusion I guess is a good enough word you don't really know what's going on and so um, that also means that there's a chance that these reports were just wrong that um, all the uh, that the worst may not have happened. And, and, and um, with every passing update, you, you realize that no, the worst has actually happened. Um, this plane isn't missing. This plane has actually gone down. Um, and I think I, you know, this was, this was 2001. I had a, I had a cell phone, but um, you know, at that time, a phone call was expensive. So I, I don't think I even had it with me. I think I just left it at my apartment. So I was truly sitting there alone um, by myself um, watching, um, watching news reports come in of, of these players that I would covered and, and interviewed um, and these uh, media folks who I knew and, and administration folks who I knew and had a really, really great relationship with um, were on the plane. And um, as hard as it is to sit here and recount that, it was so much worse to sit there and go through it. Um, you know, I was just, I, I was in high school when the Oklahoma City bombing happened, um, but that also didn't, that also happened, in, uh, I experienced it on television. I mean, I, we, we, we wheeled in the uh, old antennas, one on the little carts to watch the reports at high school and everyone was watching it all together. Um, it was one of the first times ever that I just truly felt completely isolated and alone in a way that is, is really dark, um, unhealthy and scary. And, um, don't really know exactly what I did other than, um, I know I sat there for four or five hours, um, watched and watched and watched, um, went through all the emotions that you go through. Um, you know, shock, anger. Um, I, I think a lot of the, the media, the, the media coverage, um, 
um, was it was it was really well done, but it was also you could tell that those people that were reporting it were in shock too. I mean, they had lost people they covered and their friends. Um, and Tegan's was an icon in the state of Oklahoma, and to all the journalists covering it. Um, well, Hancock was their conduit. He was the person that um, that enabled them to cover the basketball team, and I was no different. Um, and I I had known that 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 Will and Karen had uh, had an infant. I know that Andy was um, had been born a couple of months earlier, and had one of my last conversations with Will. We talked about that, um, and so just for the longest time, I just was just jaws dropped um, for that specific family because that's. That, that's just that's as bad as it gets um, in in any in any in, in any world. And eventually, eventually, I got to a point where I remembered where I was sitting. Um, I was sitting in a newsroom, still by myself. You know, this is we're talking like nine nine thirty at night now. So I've been there for three or four hours, um, and I just sort of. I sort of went from this, you know, this shock like this and um, realized I had a job to do. Um, I, I think what actually, what actually snapped me out of it was a phone ring in the newsroom. Um, and it was somebody from the Oklahoman looking for me. And they wanted to know if I could make it to the Stillwater Airport for a press conference. Um, and I really honestly didn't even realize what they were asking me. I think I said, man, I, I just can't do it. Um, hung up the phone. And then after that call, I went, oh, wait a second. I, I actually have to lead all this coverage for the Ocali. I have to, I have to put everything that I'm personally feeling, um, not aside, but I can't let that drive the next several days of my life because everybody on campus feels this way. Everybody in this community and most of the state felt that way um you know it was just just nothing but grief and that was really a, a moment for me that um that that was a real true turning point it was this the absolute worst thing that could happen has happened um and now we have to cover that for the campus and more than more than any television station, more than any any other newspaper, um, the Oklahoma State campus was going to um, process this by what we did. And again, I I was very happy we didn't have a paper to put out the next day. I was very happy that our our next edition came out on Monday because I was in no condition to lead coverage right at that moment. Um, but I really snapped out of um, my own shock and and grief and realized that there was a greater purpose that needed to be served and I would deal with my own my own feelings a little bit later. So I sent everybody on the staff an email and I said, um, anybody that can get to the press conference tonight, do it. But um, I want us all in the office. I was, I was very direct. So we're all going to be in the office at 9 a.m. Sunday um, and I'll have a plan. And I didn't really know what that plan would be, but I knew I'd come up with one. Um, so then I walk out of there, I walk back to that concert I had gone to. And um, that was my first sight of, you know, fellow students and classmates. This sold out bar for a big CD release party is quiet. And all you can hear are, are the TVs that are turned up um, and, and just sobbing and crying. And, um, you know, the loudest, the loudest voices of whisper. Um, if that, um, and that seemed like it lasted eight, eight hours. It, that, that, that part of that night, watch, seeing other people for the first time and watching them experience it, um, was that's in the top five hardest things that I've ever had to do. I had to face people. I had to, I had to see how everybody was hurt. Um, I didn't realize at the time it would help our coverage, but, um, that night I was, um, really, really, really just really overwhelmed. Um, 
the band did, did, did end up playing that night. They, they asked the crowd, do you want us to play? So they would play like 30 minutes at a time, take time off to watch TV again. Um, it was, there was nothing fun about it, but um, it, it, it did feel kind of important um, that they did that. And um, at the end of it, they said that we'll immediately get all the local musicians together for a benefit concert. And they did like 10 days later. Um, that gets me up to about 2 a.m. And despite the fact that I had been at a bar, I didn't. I don't know if I, if I drank anything that night, it was minimal. I, I was, I was as clear headed and, and uh, as, uh, and, and as together as could possibly be in that moment. I walk into my apartment and we had, uh, the, our, our, our telephone, um, I had a roommate, but he wasn't there. He was at his girlfriend's. So I just walked back into the apartment alone. One of those cordless telephones with a built-in answering machine with a light that beeps, mm -hmm. and it, it looked like it looked like an emergency siren. Just flash, 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 flash. Um, and um, the, you know, the only point that I'll bring my, myself back into it. All those calls were people that I, I at some point had told I was going to try to go to that game, and they were all just scared that I had them. Um, Jack Lancaster, who I talked about, I still have the email he sent me that night that says, I really hope you, uh, you are actually at these concerts and didn't try to cover this game. Um, uh, uh, again, I'll say that I I have no idea what that actual answer would have been. So um, there's, there's never this overwhelming could have been me feeling, but a lot of people were worried that I did. Um, so at two in the morning, I then had to call people back. Um, I mean, they could see on TV who, who was and wasn't involved. Um, so in some ways it was, their questions had already been answered, but I had to call family, friends, professors, the, the Ocali advisor in the middle of the night just to say, hey, I'm here, um, got a, an important job to do tomorrow and we'll do the best we can. Um, so I don't even know if I slept at all that night. If I did, it didn't really count. Um, the next day, um, A, it was freezing. The day before had been a nice day. The next day was just cloudy and dreary and gross. Um, and I, I got up and just, I don't think I had any water or certainly no, no coffee or caffeine. I just got up and trudged myself back to the Ocali at 9 a.m., like I said, and the newsroom was already full. Everybody was there. Um, and I said, I said, here's what we're going to do. Um, we dedicated a team of writers just to going to write the news stories and a separate team of writers to go out on campus, um, get reaction stories, um, to try and profile everybody that had been killed, um, try and somehow, some way put lives into context. And so we had a team covering the news and a team doing everything else. And then I asked not, I personally picked a team of editors to edit the news and a team of editors to edit all these other stories and obituaries. Um, I don't think I gave, I don't think anybody gave any sort of, you know, wild um, coaching speeches or anything, but we certainly did make it clear to each other that, that we, we had to help the community, um, process what had happened. Um, so I, you know, I don't even know, I don't even know exactly what sort of the discussions we had, but I know the result was, um, that, that sports section, that, that, not sports, that whole paper, um, that was just, it's, it, it's heartbreaking to read today. Everything about it is just so, it's, it's like to me, it's just like it, ha it happened yesterday, which is, I guess what, uh, I guess what a good newspaper from uh, something tragic like that should be. It should really, it should really be the uh, sort of, you know, moment in time for better or worse. And it certainly was. Um, I...
on that first day, I edited our news. I was one of the editors for our, our big news story. Um, I made the call that we were going to put any stories on the sports front, that black cover that says, you know, sports can wait. Um, uh, that was just me sitting there at the computer. I said, this is what's going to happen. I can't put a Super Bowl recap on, on this. Yeah, and the first column that I wrote was um, about Will Hancock. It was about that little anecdote that I told you of him saying, you know, come on, man, straighten up. And, you know, I like you. And uh, just me not realizing when he said it, but three months later realizing how important that had been. Um, so the very first thing that I wrote essentially was effectively his obituary for the Okali. Um, stayed up till like 2.30 in the morning when we drove the, we, we, we would put the paper, we would save it. I don't even think we had, I don't even, I think it was pre thumb drives. It was pre USB drives. I think we had actually saved the paper on, on those, uh, those, uh, those floppy disks. Um, in PDF form, and we'd drive it over to the Stillwater News Press, and then they would take it. And, and I, you know, I was in the car with our editor in chief to drive that over. I just thought that it was important that, that I be there for that. So there was, you know, now we're getting, for me personally, six hours of sleep in two days. Um, and that's before everybody goes back to campus on Monday. Um, things only, things only really are just, just, it then just became this wave after wave after wave of realizing um, just how hurt everybody was. Um, I did what I what I thought I should do in my role as the basketball writer. I was if if there was a a press conference if anybody was speaking um, from the program, I would be the one to cover it. Um, so. The first time Eddie Sutton met the media, I got to that room as early as I could to sit right in front. And I did end up right on the edge of the front row. Eddie's off in a hallway to my right with the podium here where he's going to come talk. And um, Tim and Steve Buzzard, and they're just bawling. And Eddie's, Eddie has not slept in two or three days, and his eyes are just red. And he's got this almost blank stare as, as, as a little trite, but... Um, he was just looking just very, very intently, but also at nothing. Um, just, it was one of the most painful things I've ever seen on somebody's face. So he comes and talks to the media for the first time. And that was the lead to my story. I, I wrote about watching Eddie in the hall come out. Um, st still, still the most, um, the most painful three paragraphs I've ever written because I saw how much he was hurting. Probably bubbled my grief to the surface too. Um, but I look back on that to this day in my job and um, when, when there's a tragedy to cover, I just try and I would tell other journalists and I'll tell myself um, and I'll tell colleagues at the Times that um, if you're in this situation, you know, make sure you capture what the the people most central to the story are going through. Um, the journalists. So, I mean, just everything from that from that particular moment, the first time Sutton um, spoke, um, really, 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 um, as hard as it was for me personally, um, I, I really do feel like powering through that. And, and capturing this, the absolute agony on his face before he even said a word, which was also full of agony. Um, really, really, really was a growing up point for me journalistically um, because I, I draw on that to this day. Um, the, uh, the next big event that week, um, was a memorial service in Gallagher Iowa Arena. Um, 
And I just absolutely, I, I covered it and I, I, I wrote the story, the headline, Arena Walls Filled with Tears. I'll never forget that headline. Um, and I covered it the same way I did Sutton's conference. I People people were talking and I made sure to get their quotes, but I was, you know, more concerned about the looks on people's faces. I just wanted, I felt like it was important to capture, you know, the feeling, um, which was just absolute despair. Um, it really was. I remember some colleagues from the Oklahoman um, just absolutely being overcome with emotion and tears. Um, I remember my arms around some colleagues from the Ocali. We were kind of just in a, there were three of us and I was in the middle with my arms around both of them. And there were several times that we were all just, you know, heads back and bawling. Um, it was, it was quite emotional, quite powerful. And, um, you know, I have no idea. I have no idea where that particular event falls in the uh, grand scheme of healing. Um, but uh, on campus, it was a pretty watershed moment. Um, the funerals were also tough, but you expect funerals to be tough. Um, you know, most of them you would go to and then I would, I wouldn't even go in the, the, the whatever church it was at. I would, the funerals that I attended, I always uh, would go to wherever overflow area there was, um, you know, at, at Wills, there was some separate area that somehow had a, a TV feed and that's where I watched that from. Um, but the, 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 the funerals were just poignant tributes to, to lives lost. Um, that memorial service at Gallagher Iabo was, um, so, so, so much harder because it was, both the tributes to the lives lost, but also 13,000 people in there that just did not understand why this had to happen to them. Um, and so it was just, again, uh, pretty much a microcosm of that week that that event was just everywhere you looked was just absolute sadness. Um, and the only, the only difference from person to person was the magnitude of it. Um, Uh, they 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 had the, the the families kind of the, the families of the people of the um the people who were killed um whose lives were lost they kind of they came out in order they they didn't walk out in a group they would come out kind of one by one um that was just absolutely just and, and I never want to go to that again and um I feel bad saying that because they were going through some they were going through it too in so much worse of a way. Um, it was just so painful. There's no other way to put it. Um, and I would come back from those things, from all those things I was covering and just say, just don't forget this feeling. Um, let that feeling show through in the Ocali tomorrow. And we really tried to do that. We tried to, every, we tried to make every headline capture the mood. We had a little label we put at the top of the paper every day that, the words changed, but it was always, um, you know, just a, a quick summation of how we were all feeling at the time. They canceled one basketball game, then they, uh, or they postponed it. Then they had, then they played Missouri at home, first basketball game since the crash. They ended up, Missouri was favored, Oklahoma State won. Um, and, The, you know, the, there were lots of things about that particular game that um, that lent some semblance of normalcy. Um, you know, hearing Larry Reese announce Gallagher Iba as the rowdiest arena in the country, um, hearing that band, seeing the, the the Palm Squad do the little thing. Um, there were just so many moments that that felt just normal and the way things should be. Um, in and around this whole feeling of it, just this, this can't be happening. Um, and then they won. Um, they beat a very good Missouri team. Um, and I don't remember exactly what I wrote. I'm sure it's in that stack over there, but I do remember that, that our, we went, our headline was bittersweet victory. Um, it was, uh, still a victory. And, um, I, I don't think we realized at the time how important it was that they win that game. Um, I, you know, I, it's, it's trivial to say, it's a, a trite thing to say, but it would have been so 
so devastating if they had lost that particular game. Then a few days later, they hosted a Bedlam game. And Oklahoma was a better team than Oklahoma State that year. And Oklahoma State absolutely destroyed them. Just ran them off the court. Um, that was the big emotional release. That Missouri game was, you know, you're, you're still in shock. Blowing out your rival. Blowing out Oklahoma that was supposed to beat you. That was the stand on the edge of your seats and just scream, yes! That. Um, that particular game and winning it the way they did to me was when I thought uh, um, actual real healing started because there had been a moment of release that all those other events didn't give you. Standing up and screaming your head off in support of Oklahoma State athletics in a, in a bedlam game was so, so, so important. Um, our coverage captured that. Um, headline was the spirits back on the front page. Big, bold, big, big headline. Um, and it was. Um, couldn't tell you what I wrote, but I can remember that headline. Um, and just remembering how how fun it was. I mean, to be honest, it was fun. People were so happy and they were just elated. Um, I don't know that I will ever attend another sporting event like that game. Um, really any of the Missouri game too, but that Bedlam game in particular. I was I was in Gallagher Iowa a few years later when they beat Texas to clinch the Big 12 championship the year that uh, they went to the Final Four. That got close, but um, that also had a couple of years of uh, distance between the, the crash. Um, and I think a lot of people that were there cheering for that were just cheering to cheer. I don't think there was a big like, this is another step moment, but that Bedlam game uh, couldn't have been more than two weeks after the crash at most. Um, absolutely was this watershed. We can allow ourselves to heal now moment. And um, sort of after that game, we were sort of able to transition at the Ocali back to um, what I would consider to be a normal, um, normal newspaper. And, we didn't feel like every single day um, we were processing grief anymore. The uh, the basketball program had inadvertently processed it for everybody with that with that win. Um, so then you go back to just covering the covering the news of it all, and that the rest of that year was it. it, it was probably somehow in the paper every day. Um, there was there were reports coming out. There were um, you know. There were tributes and benefits. There were, there were, there were news stories, good and bad. Um, but after that Bedlam game, we were covering those just in what I would consider uh, classic journalism. There was no longer, there was no longer this sense of this combination of, of dread and heartache to it. Um, it was just doing it because you needed to do it and. Um, but for that three week period, um, you know, I, I just really felt that it was our place at the Ocali to let everybody else that was going to read us, um, have an avenue to process what had happened. Um, let everybody know that it was okay to grieve, um, and it was okay to hurt no matter, no matter what your connection to the program was. Um, and, you know, to the, to the degree that you could get an indication, um, I, I think we did that. My indications were when basketball players came up to me and said, thanks, um, which they did a lot. My indication was when, when folks like Steve Buzzard would just come up and, and say, you know, thanks, um. That to me was the, we did the right thing. We covered this the way we should have. Um, and I really think the Ocali, more often than not in the 21 years since has um, 
you know, continued to be the place to go to, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, not forget it. That's, that's what this project is. And I, I think that, I think that the, the, this campus and this community's biggest, um, biggest way of going about that was, um, has been via the Ocali. So, you know, they, 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 they've done a really good job. They're always there at the, remember the 10 runs, they're always there at the uh, anniversary game and uh, the other events around, around campus and the, the tragedies that have happened since, um, you know, they, they've been there for the, the campus too. And um, very, very, very honored to, to have my name associated with them uh, to this day. Did, did any, during that time, was there any, like your advisor giving you all guidance on personal care? <sighs> they tried, they tried so hard. Yeah, I mean, it was new to um, them too, but. I still have all the emails from Jack Lancaster. I, I, I said that the, the very first one was just, was just an email for him saying, Josh, my, my phone is ringing off the wall. People wanting to know where, where you're at. Just tell me that you're here and I was. The next email I got was a take care of yourself email. It was, it was, this is, this is going to be harder than anything you've ever done in your life. Um, I'm here if you need to talk. I am here if you need to, um, to vent. I'm here if you need to cry. I need to do all those things. Um, but he said that to me. And so then I turned around and said it to the staff. I said, we have to take care of ourselves too. So if we, anybody gets in a situation where they feel overwhelmed, speak up and somebody else will, will, will step into whatever you were doing. And um, again, we were college students. I hesitate to call us kids. We weren't kids. 22 years old. We were 22 years old young. going through something that we, that, that 52 year olds shouldn't have to go through. Um, but we did that. We, we, we gave each other shoulders to cry on. We, we took work from somebody else when they felt like they couldn't do it anymore. Um, we took what, what Jack Lancaster said to heart and did it. And, um, you could say that it's just natural human compassion and maybe it was, but we needed to hear that and we needed to make sure that we had said it out loud. Um, I think it's good advice to, journalists to this day. I think it's good advice to, to my colleagues at the Times when they're covering tragedy. And I really hope that, that, that they're able to do that. Would you, would you discuss it in class? We did. Yeah, it was. You know, at the time, mental health was not what it is today. It was, you know, mental health was sort of a sign of weakness. So it wasn't this big open thing about, you know, you should go seek counseling or therapy. Boy, I wish it had been. My life would have been a lot different. But we did talk extensively in all of my classes about how hard it was um, on journalists to cover something like this um, and the importance of keeping a perspective on our own feelings and our own grief throughout. And that helped. Be compassionate with what you report to. Man. Um, that was actually the hardest part. Um, that's the hardest part was this, this constant worry that you weren't doing right by somebody. I'm just a, a fear that I could never let go. Am I letting somebody down by writing this story? Um, you now you had, you mentioned in, uh, in talking to me about the, uh, the, the cowboy in white, that poem. Um, I look back on that to this day and I'm really glad we, that that was in there, but I always look back. I wish I had found somebody to write one of those for all 10 people. And since then that, that has happened. So it's not like, you know, it's not like people, it's not like anybody was, was, was overshadowed, but I did look back on that cowboy and white. it would, uh, I was very proud of it. I was very happy that that was in there. Um, but also with a little, a, a little twinge of, of pain that we didn't get somebody to write something like that about all, all 10 men. Um, but, that to me never um that was that was a personal regret and not something that i felt um detracted from what we did do which was a lot 
Yes, that was, yeah. you did a lot, yes. Yes. Um, and I kind of, I was at the OU game. Yeah. And it was just loud, loud and, and they were very polite too. The, the play- Super polite, yeah. yeah. Their players came out wearing uh, OSU warm-ups, or at least they had the, the, the orange ribbon on. Um, all the other Big 12 teams were sending their uh, play-by-play announcers down to replace, uh, to do Tegan's job. Um, the the outpouring um, in, in sports was just incredible. Um, you know, the, it really showed the, uh, it really showed the, the most positive do good side of college athletics, mm-hmm. um, which is, it's a big complicated business and always had been, but in that, in, in that time, um, it was nothing but, it was nothing but, but, but healing and compassion and what it should be. Did you attend any of the away games after that? Yeah. Um, everyone that I could. Um, which, you know, and I remember the Bedlam game in Norman. We lost that. Um, I went and covered the whole Big 12 tournament in Kansas City. Um, my actual first time in a plane after the crash was flying to New York to cover the uh, NCAA tournament, which they, they, had a, they had a really tough opponent in USC, um, but you, you could tell they got there and they were just out of gas and lost in one game. And, so I tried to just write, you know, what a season this has been and uh, who cares if we got bounced in the NSA tournament. The fact we were there was such a statement um, by that program. And yeah, that was, uh, that was, I think, It was probably another 10 years before I got in and uh, before I actually traveled again to cover something related to Oklahoma State. Um, I came back, um, came back on a press pass to a couple of football games in the early uh, 2010s, including the uh, Fiesta Bowl year. Um, I think I was in Minneapolis at the time, but there was a 10 year gap between me going somewhere to cover OSU. Um, I kind of, kind of figured that, um, if I wasn't going to actively cover OSU for a living, that it was probably a good note to go out on was just letting letting my contribution to OSU sports be that that year of covering them um, to the degree that to the degree that journalism can make a difference for folks. I I, I certainly think that, that we probably did. And I guess you graduated that May. I did graduate that May. Um, so you wouldn't have been here for like the dedication of the memorial. In I came back for it just to watch. I came back for it to sort of a, uh, the Oklahoma would have let me write about it. I was working there at the time. Um, came back just to watch, um, come back for the, uh, remember the 10 game every year that I can, and I'll be there again this year. Um, I have not done the run yet, but I'm going to, um, When I uh, when I put the uh, when I put the book out um, last year, um, I talked about the plane crash from the the musical side, from what everyone went through, and kind of told that same story about just this wave of grief in the bar. But when I did that, um, I reached out to Coach Hancock. Said I've been going to all your games for all this time, but I haven't spoken to you since I covered you. Maybe we should be friends. And she said, yeah, maybe we should be friends. Um, and then I got within, within a few months, I had come out and hung out with her and her family. Um, and that includes Bill Hancock over at the NCAA. He was just one of the nicest guys in the world. And Andy is a, a journalism student in Northwestern now um, and who I've really tried, who have really offered to, to reach out to and be a mentor to in any way that I can. But that, was so very quickly overtaken by the fact that I just really like her and her family. And Andy is one of my best friends in the world, you know, 20 years younger, but who cares? Um, text her all the time. And I'll probably text her when I leave this interview and say, uh, say how moving it was to get to be a part of it. 
so getting getting close to that family again um uh, again for the first time and probably 20 years too late has been one of the most important things that happened in my life and the way that they continue to uh, represent the university and see that that these legacies carry on is is unmatched and um all of that went into uh, the New York Times article last January that I wrote this, that said, I was there and I haven't talked much about this, but now I'm going to. Um, it just feels, it, it feels like a thing to do and it feels like the time is right. And um, yeah, for the rest of my days, anytime I'm in a position um, to, to help people remember those lives um, and to help people remember what, what a, a campus truly coming together um, can be, uh, I'm going to do it. Do you do you know or care to share what triggered you to open that box in 2017? Um, the year before had been the 15 year anniversary, and I had remembered reading um, lots of tribute pieces. Um, and I remember reading Andy's piece. You put it, I think, in the O'Callaghan or the News Press. Um, and um, I remember reading them from afar, and just thinking, you know, I was a part of that too. Um, that got me thinking that it's probably time. So the next year on the anniversary, um, you know, I dug that box and it was covered in dust and picked it up and, and smelled like a 19 year old, whatever the 17 year old box would smell. Um, and looked through all those papers and, um, experiencing those again, um, all the, uh, all the pain came back, but also all the, uh, all the contributions that we made to a campus and a community healing also came back. So um, there were there were lots of tears that day, but it, well, more than that was just pride. Like man, that that was we we covered that uh, several several steps above what our league should have been. It was as good as it could have gotten, um, and so many journalists on that staff at the Ocali at that time went on to just have wonderful careers. Um, two separate Pulitzer finalists um, were, were, were covering, were covering that. Um, another person that's one of the, one of the top community editors at the Arizona Republic now, um, one of the best AP writers in Oklahoma and this region for the better part of 15 years was on that staff. Um, and then there's me, I'm at the New York times. That's where you want to go in journalism. Um, so I, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just happening in a vacuum. The covering that event, um, continues to impact journalism all around the world. And it just amazes me that someone at 21, 22 knew what to do. Yeah. Seem, seemingly knew what to do and, yeah. it, and it worked out great. It did. I don't know. It would be a very hard time. I was here too during yeah. all that, but and reading all of that again brought things up too, but not nearly as much. I mean, it's that comp comes back to compassion. I yeah, think. it really does. And did you go to the the Kansas game at the Allen Fieldhouse? I did. Yes. You, um, what do you recall from that? I recall that they blew us out. <laughs> um, well, not the final score, but. Just um, the whole feeling. I, you know, Kansas was very good, and they um, they sold that place out. Um, but like in the Bedlam games, that arena understood that we were we were experiencing a, um, just a wave after wave of emotion, and were so welcoming to us. So, you know. Their cheers for Oklahoma State did not feel um, patronizing. It felt sincere. Um, I'll never forget that either. And I had read that that the following Monday after the crash that the Ocali had 80,000 80, hits. Oh, yeah. On their website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I have no idea where that ranks these days, but at the time, that was unheard of. That was absolutely unheard of. Um, it was, we weren't an internet-based publication at all. And to see that many people 
people coming to the website and really wanting to experience, not wanting to, really needing to experience that journalism in real time, um, certainly was a, certainly a lot of groundwork for my career. Well, who had to who had to read through those and decide what to do, if anything, with them? We made the decisions collectively, um, the same way we did with the paper. Um, we did we we had the ability even then to to make something uh, a big top story and make something not, and um, just by putting a little number in uh, in a story would uh, would ensure where it went and. Again, it was such an afterthought compared to the paper, but we were saying this needs to be the top story on the homepage. This needs to be here and here. Um, just not realizing at the time how important that would, would go on to become. Mm -hmm. Any criticism from anyone? Man, I if there were, they kept it would. themselves. Yeah. yeah um, I, I cannot think of anybody... Um, at any time that it came out and said that there was something that was done wrong. Um, it doesn't you, mean that we didn't do anything wrong. It just means that nobody felt the need to say it. Well, before the crash, you had said that Eddie Sutton had commented on something you had written mm -hmm. in your story. Do you remember what it was? I do remember what it was because I wrote a column about that too. Um, and I, at the end of that year, I put it in, I, I wrote about it. I wrote about that incident. Um, I had gone to cover the Missouri football game in Missouri, and um, this was at a time when gambling was pretty taboo. The NCAA would really crack down, and you couldn't it couldn't be around it in the locker room. But um, because it was run by the state, right in the uh, end zone was a big ad for the Missouri lottery, and I, uh, I came back from that game and just wrote, "What is this? Why? How are we?" Are we taking this hardline stance against gambling and also being sponsored by gambling? I don't care if it's state run. And that was what Eddie was calling about. He called to say, you know, we as coaches have to walk this fine line on gambling at all times. Um, and it was just so refreshing to see somebody, um, somebody in the Ocali um, see that and, and, and understand what position it puts us in. Um, and then we started talking about the, the upcoming Iowa State homecoming game. If we thought we had a chance to win it or not. I th I, we agreed that we were going to win it, and then we I think we ended up losing in overtime. Oh. <laughs> it happens. It happens. Who was the coach? Simmons? Bob Simmons. Yeah, it was Simmons' oh, last season. And it was somewhere close to when Les yeah. Miles was around. Yeah, because uh, Les Miles I was introduced as coach like, gosh, feels like, just like maybe just, just a few weeks before the crash, it feels like. I think it was like early December. Okay. Yeah. And then at graduation, I didn't... Did uh, President Halligan give posthumous degrees to? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Dan and Nate. He did. Um, I don't remember a lot of that graduation ceremony. Uh, it was just, it was just really hot. Um, but I have all the pictures, and I and I did save all the uh, um, all the Ocali articles about it. There, that that was there. Um, I had some very nice. President Halligan said some really nice things. Uh, to me over the course of that semester too, that I'll never forget. I think I might even still have those emails too. Mm. Yeah. Um, grew up, um, but also, also didn't also, you know, I hope I, I hope I never lose. Uh, I hope I, I hope I, I never forget that, that feeling because um, it has taught me so much. Um, and it's been such an important part of my life. And what were your parents? How were they doing with all of this? With Well, um, it's always been real hard. I, I, I've never been able to get a really good gauge um, from them. Obviously, you know, they were part of the, the, they were part of that wave of phone calls that first night. Um, but, but since then, I, I, you know, I don't know if they've, uh, if they've been either in denial, they've been very supportive, but um, they, they just don't talk about it a lot. And I think, I don't think it has to do with anything related to grief, although I guess I could ask them. Um, well, I, I just think that, um, that that they just view it as something that, that happened, another tragedy that happened and it was, and, the, and that we covered it and then moved on. Um, yeah, maybe, that's, maybe I should ask them. But, um, you know, they were always very supportive and they, anytime I want to talk about it, they let me in, that's, that's enough. I think that, they would be checking on you regularly yeah. <laughs> during that. Yeah. Well, then, then, then 
fast forward a little bit, come September 11, 9 11. Same year. Um, and you were still in Oklahoma? I, I was. I, I actually was not. I was. I graduated and lived in Oklahoma City, but I drove up and helped the Ocali put out the paper that day. Um, it was all the same people from the crash. Um, September 11th, as a journalist, was so much easier because of what we had gone through. It just was. There's no way other way to put it. It made covering, it made processing September 11th as journalists really straightforward for us. Mm -hmm. We felt like we had had the blueprint. Um, and then we just went out and, and did it. And um, the college should be very proud of that too. Um, but going through what we had just a few months earlier really, really, really laid that groundwork. And thinking that the turn points for you, I mean, just if you had not walked into the O'Callie's office and said, hmm, I'd like a job. Yeah. You know, if, and if you hadn't decided to come here. Yeah, everything, everything there. Gosh. Everything about my life has been filtered in one way or the other or connected to that um, and always will be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know. Really glad I eventually embraced that because it's really important that people that were a part of it do. Okay. Well, we've covered a lot today. My last question to you will be: How do you want people to remember you? Um, man, if we're talking about about that time, I just hope that people remember that um, I was a student going through it with them, and I hope our coverage showed it. Um, these days, I just hope I represent the university well. I honestly, really. It's probably more important to me that that um, Oklahoma State is able to look at me as somebody that, that they're proud of and an alum that represents them in all the ways alums should. Um, that's not for me to say, but um, that's what I want. That's what I really would like um, out of OSU these days. And I've come back. I'm a season ticket holder now. I get to go to lots of games. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, get to donate a little bit of uh, a little bit back and that's always good. But really, really for me, it's just, you know, am I making this university proud or at least give them something to feel good about that? That, that drives a lot uh, for me to this day. Well, then I should say I want one more question. Yeah. How did you end up at The New York Times? I mean, talk a little bit about why, what, how that worked in once. Well, once you sort of see the newspaper industry, the media industry, I guess, sort of starting to slide, it became obvious that if, if I wanted to have a long lasting career, I needed to get to the New York Times or Washington Post. So when I was listing all those jobs earlier, they were always taken with an eye toward being a stepping stone to one of those places. Okay. And once I got to the plane dealer and was just absolutely thriving in that job, it really was just a matter of time until the New York Times had an opening that I could fill. And it worked out just like I thought it would. Cleveland was where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, so you had, you yes. had to leave. Yes, lived down there right by that. I used to go there a lot. Um, Not red dirt, but close. yeah, but um, a lot of a lot of a lot of music that inspired red dirt. So um, I uh, I went there often, and I still go back. I, I love Cleveland. I'll speak really highly of Cleveland. I go back there and visit, um, and have visited the Rock Hall since. So, how long have you been at the New York Times? Since uh, February of twenty seventeen, and. So you never say never, but I don't plan on taking another job in journalism. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see what the world brings, but right now I'm really happy there. Come back for a, a lecture, guest lecture. I'm happy to. I, I, would, I would always be honored that um, um, anything I can ever do for OSU, I'll do. Well, then do you want to talk about your book a little bit? Say anything about it? In, um, in, in, in. May as well. Um, you know, it's about the Red Dirt music scene, which grew up in Stillwater. Um, it's centered around Stillwater, and uh, the campus has a, a big part to play in it. And OSU alums had a big part to play in it. Um, you know, it's it, it's a music scene that went on to thrive. And um, and some people took, took it to the highest of heights. And uh, they all have some way, shape, or form a uh, tie to this, uh, this town. And it's all in there. Um, I sort of got out of the way and let those musicians tell their story, but it's in there. Um, I'm gonna, you can find it on Amazon and all the places, but uh, in town it should be at Joe's, Eskimo Joe's, and uh, always at reddirtbook.com. And I'm gonna do a sequel, it will not be Stillwater focused, but it will be focused on um, the, the, the mountain music coming out of Idaho and the Pacific Northwest. The uh, the Reckless Kellys of the world, uh, the Susie Boggesses and uh, Ned Ledoux, and, um, Pinto Bennett, the old cowboy songwriters um, and poets um, that sort of 
inspired a wave of Americana music that uh, as a cousin to Red Dirt I'm fascinated with and that'll be my next project that I'm just now getting uh, getting a jump on and I would expect that late 2022 early 2023 so you've moved away away from sports <laughs> I have although I still love it <laughs> That's your sports. Um, sports is a, is a is a healthy obsession for me now. I don't, I'm glad I don't have to cover it though. All right. Well, then I thank you for coming today. Thank, thank you for having me. This was this was uh, some of it was hard to talk about, but um, I'm I'm glad I could contribute. You did a great job. Appreciate that. <laughs>